the shades of night till Jesus came to me. And with the sunlight of his love bid all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of his love within. Hello, my name is David Baker and I'm an evangelist. I partner with the Church of Christ that meets at 1551 East 8th Street in Mesa, Arizona. And we'd like to invite you to come to worship with us and study the Bible. Our meeting times are Sunday morning at 9.30, 10.30, Sunday evening at 6, and Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. I may be reached by telephone at 480-898-3651. My email address is sunnybaker at cox.net. Our website address is cfcmesa.com. Good morning to all. We're glad to see you this morning and glad to be coming to you with a message from God's Word. I'd like to read a little passage from uh, John chapter 4 and beginning in verse 19 where it says, The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. Ye worship that which ye know not. We worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for such doth the Father seek to be his worshippers. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Always a lot of controversy involved in worship. People have always had questions about it. And just such a controversy as we have read about is one that sometimes arises today. Where men ought to worship. How men ought to worship. And what does God expect of us. I'm afraid that the tendency today is to be governed more by fads and trends than by what God says. And those fads and trends, they affect us personally. Even if we are religious people, even if we're deeply religious people, and it affects God's people as a group in the church. The tendency today is for people to emphasize individual involvement only, kind of a libertarian view toward religion. I've got my religion and I keep it to myself and I worship on my own and, and it's nobody else's business and there's nobody else involved. A long time ago, a, a country western singer named Don Williams sang a a song called I Believe in You and he encapsulated this this attitude pretty well when he uh, said th these lyrics or sang these lyrics I don't believe that heaven waits for only those who congregate and that seems to be the general consensus of the world today as people uh, seek to satisfy their religious needs and, and their need to worship God Surveys tell us that people are forsaking organized religion even the trendy large uh, Churches, the mega churches, are beginning to uh, be weak in their attendance. They're, they're forsaking uh, church attendance for a more personal spirituality, at least that's the way they look at it. And this has an effect on the church, of course. The purpose of the church becomes to serve the temporal needs of the individual and not uh, connect itself to the evangelistic or spiritual needs because people feel like they've already got that taken care of. And so the church has got to exist for something so it finds another purpose. Worship becomes a program or a show rather than worship and its purpose becomes to gratify those who come. The work of the church becomes social or political. It goes away from salvation. It goes away from the gospel because people feel like they're satisfied on their own without all of that in the church. Other activities than worship begin to replace worship like uh, Cowboys for Christ uh, have rodeos and during the rodeos they'll take a pause, take the Lord's Supper and sing a song or two and pray and then they go right back to their rodeo. I know one fellow who's a member of a motorcycle club and his worship is they go on a bike ride on Sunday mornings to some exotic place and they stop their bikes and turn off their engines, have prayer, and then they go on, the, on their way as though they had satisfied God's requirement as far as worship is concerned. Well, what does the Bible say all, about all of this? And what is God's attitude toward this libertarian view toward religion? Well, people have reasons for rejecting organized religion, at least as they describe it. 
And some of them are good reasons and some of them are bad reasons. But I believe, I'm afraid, that the main reason people reject organized religion, they just don't want to go to church. They just don't want to go. Sunday is their day off. They like to sleep late. And with reference to spiritual things, they just get lazy. Now, I know all about that because I have a tendency to do that on Monday morning when I'll be getting up and going to the bank. And sometimes I, my 9 o'clock appointment at the bank, deposit uh, money or draw money out, becomes a 12 o'clock appointment. Because I'm lazy and I, I'm tired, that's, that's a slow day for me. Well, people who have Sunday off sometimes will sleep in rather than go to church because it's more important to them, I'm afraid. Some are not interested in the obligations of membership. They're up bright and early on Sunday morning, but they just don't want to become involved in another group, in another organization. Or maybe they don't want to have uh, to put money in a plate. They don't know where it's going. There are some who reject organized religion because they will not be held accountable for the lifestyle or behavior that they have chosen. Now, they recognize that there are others in the church that will hold them responsible. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, the writer says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit to them, for they watch in behalf of your souls. Here the writer of Hebrews is talking about elders in the church who are watchful on behalf of our souls. They watch our behavior. They watch uh, our conduct to make sure that we stay on the straight and narrow. We are to watch for each other, not just pe people in positions of authority are responsible, but we're responsible for one another. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 24 and 25, the writer says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking our own assembling together as the custom of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day drawing nigh. So here's the obligation to provoke one another into love and good works and to exhort one another day by day. And so there's some responsibility that we have toward others in the church, and there's some accountability that we have toward uh, others in the church. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest happily there should be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in falling away from the living God. Watch for one another. It's kind of like when you go swimming, you're not supposed to go swimming by yourself. When you're walking through this spiritual world here in, on this earth, it's good for you not to be going by yourself because you need somebody to help you. You need somebody to watch out for you, just like when you go swimming. So, there are some people that don't like that. And they will not answer to those who would call them into question or criticize their lifestyle or the things that they do. And they're described in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10, where Peter says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment under the day of judgment. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of defilement and despise dominion. Daring or presumptuous, self will they tremble not to rail at dignities or th those who have authority over them. They will not be governed. They despise dominion. Usually that's expressed this way. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And that's directed at those in the church who would be helpers or those who would give advice or those who would teach from the scriptures. Nobody's going to tell them what to do. Now, everybody serves something or someone. And the problem is these people just have a different master than we have. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That which pertains to this life is what rules over them. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey the lust thereof. Here's the individual who is a, service, a servant to his appetites. What his lusts or his bodily desires dictate is what he does, whether it's right or wrong. And Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, We can't serve two masters. Because you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and the things of this world. Well, there are some people who have that disposition and they will not be ruled. And that is why they reject organized religion. But they forget one thing, that even though they reject Jesus as the king and reject his word by rejecting organized religion, they will one day answer to him in John chapter 12 and verse 48. Jesus says, He that rejecteth me 
and receiveth not my sayings hath one that judgeth him. The word that I spake, the same shall judge him in the last day. We have a judge. We have one that we must give answer to, and we shall give answer to. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, Paul says, For we must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So we may ignore the judge, we may deny accountability, but we shall be held accountable. Now, there is another reason sometimes people reject the church. Not just because they don't want to go to church, they don't want to be involved, they don't want to be restrained. But sometimes they reject organized religion because of what they see in organized religion. And you almost find yourself saying, well, who can blame them? One of the things that people see when they look at organized religion is form with no substance. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 15 and verses 7 through 9 when he talks about hypocrisy among the religious of his day. He says there, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They honor me with their lips. They go through the motions. They call themselves Christians. They go to church. But in their daily lives, their conduct does not conform to what the Bible teaches. Paul also addresses this in Romans chapter 2 when he talks about Jewish Christians in the city of Rome. In Romans chapter 2 and beginning in verse 1, Romans chapter 2 and uh, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, Wherefore thou art without excuse, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doth practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that practice such things. Now you skip over a little bit down to verse uh, uh, 21 of Romans chapter 2 where he says, Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest that a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest that a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou rob temples? Thou who gloriest in the law through thy transgression of the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, even as it is written. Their lives were inconsistent with their profession. And people can see that, and on account of that, many people reject organized religion. So there is the hypocrisy of false lives. There is the hypocrisy of going just simply through the form. Sometimes people uh, will be listening to someone expound on the Bible, and what they hear is not what the Bible says. And on account of that, many reject organized religion because those who are leaders in organized religion do not teach consistently with the Bible that they claim is God's Word. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 13, Paul tells those of us who are evangelists and tells really all of us who are Christians, hold the pattern of sound words which thou hast heard from me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Hold the pattern of sound words. Stick with the Bible. Teach what the Bible says. Don't go off uh, the reservation, so to speak, with reference to Bible teaching. And people will appreciate it. But when somebody begins to teach something that is not in the Bible, and others see it, then they begin to wonder about that organization, don't they? That organization is being represented, be it the church or some denomination or anything else. Now, First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21, Paul tells the, the brethren in Thessalonica, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. In other words, do everything by the Bible. Just let the Bible be your guide. Let that be your sole source of authority. And people will appreciate it. They'll see that. Others see in organized religion that it's not about salvation. It's not about God. It's not even about them. It's about the money. And Paul warns about this in 1 Timothy chapter 6 when he talks of those who suppose that godliness is a way of gain in verse 5. There are some who preach for money, career preachers, professional preachers, who are in it for the money. And that's what they emphasize. I was talking to someone the other day about uh, where they went to church and they were dissatisfied because every sermon was a request for money to support the ministry. The man looked at his wife, and she looked at him, and she said, What ministry? 
All they're doing is asking for money. There's no preaching. There's no telling people what to do or, or, or telling them about the love of God or Christ. It's just giving money to support the ministry. Well, I have to admit, in some cases, that's what all the people see. That's usually not all that's there, but that's what they see. That's what's emphasized, and so they have a legitimate complaint. And so they reject organized religion because they suppose that it's all like that. Peter warned in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3 of those who would make merchandise of us. That is, they make their living off religion rather than religion being the cornerstone of their lives. And so people reject on account of that. One reason that a lot of people reject organized religion today is because organized religion doesn't stand for anything. People have kind of a cafeteria idea toward religion. You can just pick and choose what you want, and you can leave what you don't want behind. And churches encourage that. There are some churches that would not tell you the truth if they thought for a minute that it might hurt your feelings and cause you to leave. They won't risk it. They won't risk it because they don't love you. If people love you and they want to see you go to heaven, they're going to tell you the truth. They're going to tell you what the Bible says. And it's like, like my dad used to say whenever I got uh, kind of crossroads with him, he'd say, truth hurt, hurts, doesn't it, boy? And I'd say, yes, sir, truth hurts. I remember that. Sometimes it does, especially when I am in the wrong, when I'm not following the truth. But there's some churches that won't risk that. You see, the bottom line is their bottom line. They want to put numbers, uh, attendance numbers up on the board for people to see. And that is their conquest. Our conquest is over the powers of Satan and bringing people out of that power into the power of God and the kingdom of the Son of His love. That's what we're about. And that's what all preachers ought to be about. And we need to get back to it. But people, people sometimes will not have that. They won't stand for it. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, For the time will come when they will not endure the sound doctrine, but having itching ears will heap to themselves teachers after their own lusts and will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside into fables. Well, Jeremiah talks about the same problem and the fact that the people love to have it so. They love to have preachers that they can manipulate through the purse strings. Tell them what they want to hear. Well, we can't do that and please God. And we won't do it. And please our, to please ourselves or to please anybody else. We are dedicated to the truth. We have a love of the truth as God has delivered it. And we're to be faithful to that. And you need to be faithful to it too. Demand of those who preach to you, book, chapter, and verse for the things that they say. Well, what about organized religion as you read about it in the Bible? And you do read about it in the Bible. The New Testament church is an organization. Let me show you a couple of passages to show you what God thinks about organized religion as He has designed it. Look first of all at Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 10 and 11. There He says, To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God according to His eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. This eternal purpose, that is a reference to what God planned to do through Jesus Christ before He created the heavens and the earth. And He says that making known His wisdom through the church was a part of that eternal purpose. The plan for the church existed before creation. And it's God's plan. In Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 2, Jesus is called a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. What's he talking about? He's talking about the church that you read about in the Bible. It is the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Now in writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and beginning in verse 9, Paul says, For we are God's fellow workers, that is himself and Apollos. You are God's building. God's husbandry, according to the grace of God, which was given unto me as a wise ma master builder, I laid a foundation. And another built there. And what does he mean he laid a foundation? He taught the gospel. And another built there. Um, Apollos came and he expanded on Paul's teaching through inspiration, teaching what he knew and what he had learned about God. 
But let each man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation of God's organized religion is not the personality or ministry of some evangelist or televangelist, but Jesus Christ himself. And so we honor that. You look at Mark, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and there we uh, read in verse 18 the words of Jesus. And I also say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The word there is Hades, not hell. It's the place of the dead. What Jesus is saying is, I'm going to build a church. They can kill me, but I'm still going to build that church. Jesus built the church. It is not the invention of men. It's not something that men have imposed on others. Jesus built the church. And even though they put him to death, they could not stop him from doing that. In fact, they made it possible by putting him to death for him to build the church. In Acts, the 20th chapter, we read in verse 28, Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit hath made you bishops, to feed the church of the Lord which he purchased with his own blood. Is the church important to Jesus as, he, as we read about in the scriptures? Absolutely. He bought it with his blood, and yet it has an organization. It is an organized religion, but it's God's organization and not man's organization. And I think, I hope that most people think in those terms when they think about organized religion. When we reject organized religion, we of course reject man's organization. And we accept God's organization, but I'm afraid that's not the way it is. Sometimes it's our excuse for rejecting even what God has given us. And I think you can see that, don't you? Well, anyway, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I espoused you unto one husband, that I might present you as a pure virgin unto Christ. The church is described in the scriptures as the bride of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it, that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now imagine this for just a second, fellas. A friend comes along and he invites you to dinner. He's going to have a big feast, a big party, and he's going to have dinner. And he says, I really want you to come. I really want you to enjoy this feast. And, and so you come and you, you come on time and be ready to just have the time of your life. But don't bring your wife. We don't like her. That's what people do to Jesus. They accept Jesus into their heart, they think. And they don't mind Jesus coming into their heart as long as he doesn't bring his bride. As long as they don't have to have any dealings with the church. It doesn't work that way, friends. If, if you accepted such an invitation from someone, you wouldn't mar be married long. If an individual accepts such an invitation, doesn't uh, welcome the bride of Christ, or issues such an invitation, doesn't uh, allow for the bride of Christ, there's going to be problems. Jesus is not going to come because he loves his wife. He loves his bride. And we cannot, we cannot have Jesus without having his organization for religion. In Ephesians chapter 1, another passage that we want to note in the book of Ephesians, verse 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Everything that we have from God is in Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10, Paul says, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And in him ye are made full, who is the head of all principality and power. All spiritual blessings, including salvation, come through Jesus. In him we are made full. But now notice Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, where Paul says this about God and Jesus. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, that is, under the feet of Christ, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. What does he say about the church? 
It is the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. We have the fullness of God and His blessings in Christ, but the fullness of Christ is in the church. Well, what about my obligations toward the church? Well, God's expectation of me is I identify with a local group and work with them. I become a part of the body. And as I become a part of the body, then the church grows and his cause prospers. And other people hear about the gospel and are saved from their sins. It is also a means of me expressing my devotion and love toward God in my participation. But somebody always asked with reference to their obligations, does that mean I have to go to church? And sometimes you just wonder what age group you're talking to. It sounds like a little child. He wants all the benefits of, uh, uh, of the goodies that, he, that he's been promised by his parents, but he doesn't want to do anything. You have to educate him a little bit. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, this is the answer to that question. It says, not forsaking our own assembling together as the custom of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day drawing out. Yes, you have to go to church. You have to assemble with the saints. You have to find people who are faithful to the book and fellowship them and work with them in order to accomplish the things that God wants, wants you to do. That's what the Bible says. That's what we've just read out of the Scriptures. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, we find that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. He added them to the church when they were baptized. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, it says, For in one spirit were you all baptized into one body. If you haven't been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, then you need to think seriously about it and submit your will to His through obedience so that you might become a part of His organization, the church that you read about in the New Testament. I want to thank you very much for listening this morning. I want you to know that we're praying for you. I hope that you pray for us and what we're trying to do. And we want to invite you to come and study with us at the 8th Street Church of Christ in Mesa, Arizona. Thank you very much for listening. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me, and with the sunlight of his love bid all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today, sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of his love within. Though clouds may gather in the sky and billows round me roll, however dark the world may be, I've sunlight in my soul. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight. My name is David Baker, and I preach for the Eighth Street Church of Christ in Mesa, Arizona. I hold in my hand the Bible, it's the Word of God. In the Bible, we find the answers to the great questions of life, where we came from, where we're headed, and why we're here. We'd like to explore these questions and the answers that you find in the Bible with you at 6.30 in the morning on ION TV. Please join us, won't you?